In this chapter, we'll discuss person-centered counseling. So the objectives for this chapter are to be able to list Roger's six conditions in a client relationship, list and explain the principles of motivational interviewing, explain the communication methods used in motivational interviewing, explain how reflective listening is used, explain the health belief theory or health belief model, and describe the guidelines for directive counseling. So just to give you a background a little bit on this theory is there's some concepts that are very clearly defined. So this talks about Rogerian counseling, which we'll discuss, and motivational interviewing, where some other theories and topics are kind of, there's still some meat on the bone to discuss. Um, and so they're related, uh, but they're actually separate concepts. And so we'll talk about them because you need to know the definitions, um, but they're, they're not the same thing. And that'll make more sense once we go through the content. So looking at using theories and models. So we've talked about specific skills. So how do you ask questions? How do you respond to your clients? But you also need an overarching theory that's going to drive this client patient, you know, counselor relationship of how do you want to approach things. And so one will select a theory and then an intervention to achieve this behavior change. And so, you know, you may find that you agree mostly with this theory and that's what you want to base your practice on, or you agree more with this theory. Uh, but again, this is just kind of overarching and you'll see that many people are using pieces from multiple theories. And so again, nutrition counseling is a collaborative counselor, patient or client relationship. So again, they're going to have to do most of the work and the heavy lifting, but you're helping guide them to these decisions, these behavior changes. So counseling assists people in learning about themselves and their environments. So in this case, right, their behaviors about food, why they're making the choices they are, the environments that they're in that are leading to these choices, etc. So the first thing this text talks about is non-directive counseling. So non-directive doesn't mean we have an end goal, but it's much more meandering in how we get there. So this is all kinds of curly cues and side tangents. So, and this is gonna be really based on the direction of the client. So the other names for this is going to be client-centered, person-centered, or Rogerian counseling. And so this is a theory by Carl Rogers is where he come up with this Rogerian counseling. And the way I think of it, right, is that you think of Mr. Rogers in the neighborhood, which is so, uh, loving everybody, accepting everybody, and this just kind of happy, non-directive counseling is how I can try to always remember who came up with this theory. So this is Carl Rogers. And so here the client directs the flow of conversation. So it may be direct, but again, it may have meandering and different paths and tangents and based on what they're thinking at the time or what they want to work through. And so our relationship right, is going to be supportive and not reconstructive. Now, according to Carl Rogers, for this non-directive counseling to be successful, there has to be six conditions between the counselor and the patient or client. And so the first one is the relationship needs to be accepting. And so what we're talking about here is that we're accepting them as individuals, that we're acknowledging that these people are just people. They have good and bad. There's conflicts. There's inconsistencies. And so again, we'll talk about, and this ties a lot into unconditional positive regard, which is a specific aspect of that relationship, but it builds into this larger relationship overall of, of this helping relationship. The second condition is vulnerability. So again, as the text says, the client is vulnerable to anxiety in the relationship, but is motivated to continue. So again, when you're actually expressing things that actually matter, right? The patient's going to be vulnerable. They're going to feel stress, anxiety, etc. The next is genuineness and specifically with congruence. And so that is, you know, congruence is what you're saying is what's actually being reflected. So someone has to genuinely be interested in this helping relationship. If you're just doing this for a paycheck, right, it's very difficult to have this genuineness, right, this congruence and the fact that you're interested in helping this patient in this helping relationship. Now, I cannot stress this enough because this is one of the key components of Rogerian counseling is unconditional positive regard, which is our fourth condition. And so unconditional positive regard, right? This is just 
I accept you as you are. You are okay as you are. You are a person who makes bad choices, and we're going to work on those, but you are not a bad person. You just are who you are, and we accept you that way. We also need accurate empathy, which is our fifth condition. And so again, this is being able to understand what the client's going through, what the client's trying to express. And again, you can work on these skills with things like paraphrasing and making sure that you're understanding correctly what the patient's trying to explain and what they're going through. And number six is perception of genuineness, where again, the client needs to actually perceive that they are being accepted and understanding from their counselor. So again, you have to have this, and again, that perception of genuineness is not, even if you do mean it, the client has to understand, right, that you're really accepting them and that you're working towards improving their behaviors and they're okay as they are as a person. Now next, though, the book will actually talk about is motivational interviewing, um, which is kind of the opposite. So Rogerian counseling, again, is very much client-directed. It's non-directive. You're going to talk about what's on your mind because that's the important stuff. What's stressing you? What are you thinking about? And then you have motivational interviewing, which is directive. So it's still client-centered, so we're still focusing on what the client wants, what they want to work on, etc. But we're going to give them a much stronger nudge in the direction of things they should be working on. And so again, it's useful for those that are reluctant to change. So again, remember, people don't change until they change their mind about something, so they want to do it. And so that's what this technique really does, is helps people come to that conclusion that they want to make a behavior change. And so there's lots of research specifically using this with health problems like diabetes, heart disease, other dietary changes and exercise. So how do I get you to find taking care of your diabetes is important to you? right, and then making those appropriate behavior changes. And so the one of the big constructs of motivational interviewing, and realize there's an entire book and an entire course on just motivational interviewing, so we're talking more about this from a conceptual standpoint, but what we want to do is we want to resolve ambivalence. And so ambivalence is the existing of, multi, of mutually conflicting feelings about thoughts or ideas, and so that's on one hand, I do want to take care of my diabetes. On one hand, it's a big hassle and I just, I just don't really want to. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to work on it, right? It's that, that ambivalence where I kind of do, I kind of don't. There's things in my way. And so done correctly, motivational interviewing, right, helps address this ambivalence and reduces it, right, so that you are less wishy-washy about making the change and you are, wait for it, motivated to make a change, thus motivational interviewing. So diving a little bit more into motivational interviewing and looking at the philosophy of motivational interviewing. So again, there's three components, which is, so the first one is this is a partnership, which is I'm not trying to make you do something, I'm trying to work with you and guide you towards making these behaviors. And that ties directly into, which is evocation or evoking something, where again, you can't make someone change. I can't make you do this. What I want is I want to evoke in my client their own motivations, their own thoughts, and it comes to them where they go, I want to do this, I care about this, or I don't care about this, but I care about a different aspect. So again, evocation. And then the last one is honoring client autonomy, which again, similar to how we set proper goals, they need to be something that's client driven. So what do they want to do? What do they want to change? What do they want to work on? How they want to work on it? I can make suggestions if they need additional information, and we'll talk about that with the next acronym, but I'm not doing it for them, right? They're coming up with it. I'm not going to tell them what to do. You know, that's not a good goal. You should do this instead, right? That's not, it's, it's up to them. And again, that's that big component is that you can't make someone change. They have to want to. So again, this makes a great flashcard or a set of flashcards is there's an easy acronym for the principles of motivational interviewing. Now again, remember, this is an entire book or an entire class, and we've distilled this down to a part of one lecture, but that acronym is RULE. And so the first one is resist the writing reflex. And so what we'll see then is that if people have wrong information or if people have maybe not optimal goals and we want to fix it for them, no, you should, you should do this. 
or you should work on this, right? And again, we need to resist trying to correct the client. The next one is understanding your client's motivation, which again, seems pretty self-explanatory, but I can't tell you the amount of times that this makes a difference. So for example, when you tell people, if you don't control your diabetes, you're gonna get neuropathy and they might have to cut off parts of your toes or part of your fingers due to poor circulation and poor nerve sensation. And they go, I don't care. I'm tired of walking anyways, cut off my toes. I don't care. But instead, right, if somebody's passion is, I'm just making, I'm just giving you an example. And, um, so, I, so if somebody wants to, for example, their big retirement hobby is fishing. And hey, if you don't control your diabetes, you won't have the dexterity anymore to actually tie knots, right, when you're trying to fish. That's much more important to them than, well, you should control your blood sugar because. Why? Because it's good for you. So what? Right, you have to understand what's going to motivate them and what they find important. The next one is listening. And so again, this goes back to those previous interviewing skills, which is listening, paraphrasing, actually letting the client do the talking. Again, this is why this is part of the reason why it still falls under that Rogerian counseling, right? This client centered, which is I'm going to listen. You're going to talk about what's important to you. Now I might help guide the conversation, but again, it's really listening to them, not talking at them. We have empowering our clients. And so here again, when it comes to looking at the Again, we're not telling them what to do and being careful with educations, but here's where we're making suggestions or really giving them the tools they need for their own success. So how do we build up their self-efficacy, right? They may need specific tools. So if they actually want knowledge, if they're like, I'd like to learn more about this, or I need some specific examples, right? We're going to empower them and give them that, but we're not forcing it on them or telling them what to do. Next, you have micro skills of motivational interviewing. So here we have a separate acronym. This is ORS. And again, this is all part of the natural interview process that you're probably already familiar with, but we're putting specific terms to it. So we are asking open ended questions. So again, this goes all the way back to chapter three and interviewing, which is open ended questions allow the client to talk. They're going to take the direction of the conversation where they'd like to go. You're going to find out what's important to them. Next, we have affirming. And so especially when people have been unsuccessful with their behavior changes, right? We need these affirmations and telling them that they are trying hard. They are putting forth the effort. Look at these small successes. Again, that helps build that self-efficacy and that confidence. Looking at reflecting or reflective listening. And so again, this is very similar to those interview skills and those different types of responses. You know, this is your classic, well, it sounds like, or you're telling me a lot about, or it seems like you're really focused on. And so again, this is engaging in that conversation. Again, still making sure that you're understanding for meaning and content, but getting the client to do most of the talking. And then summarizing, where again, it's very similar to reflecting, but we're kind of summarizing or bringing a focus to the entire session. So again, because this is still directive, but it's client-centered, right? It can go on tangents as they explore why I'm motivated, why I'm not motivated. And we need to sometimes come back full circle, kind of summarize, and then what are we focusing on? One of the other concepts is what's known as client change talk. And so these are the client's statements that suggest the target behavior that needs to be changed. And so again, this is going back to and looking at that ambivalence, which is, do I really need to change? What do I need to change? What do I want to focus on? And so you have to really listen carefully for when the patient finally does reach that conclusion and they go, okay, well, this is what I want to work on. Or, you know, I'd like to do more of this, or I wish I did more of that. And that's kind of like when you have to go in for the kill and go, okay, let's talk more about that. But you really have to listen for when the client is talking about that. And so one of the things to help with that is the acronym DARN, which is desires, abilities, reasons, and needs. And so this again goes to that behavior change. And then when the client does start to finally reach that conclusion of, well, this is what I need to change, then we can kind of focus on their desire to change or their ability to change or what their reasons are. So why they want to change or what their need, what they need to do to make this change. So again, this kind of gives us, once you know what to hone in on and pounce on, 
this acronym kind of helps you identify within that client change talk what to focus on or how to get that client to again evoke more of those thoughts about that behavior change. And so next the text talks about some general counselor approaches and so what motivational interviewing looks like. Again, remember this is a focus on reflection rather than responding with questions and advice. So this is not an education session. This is not, here's the facts you need to know about heart disease or diabetes. Why don't you want to change, etc. right? This is not Q and A. This is very much letting the client explore it. Do they have questions? What are they thinking about? What's motivating them to change? And so again, using a non-directive guiding style, again, to help elicit the client's motivation. So it's still a directive style when you're using MI because we're trying to direct them towards a behavior change, but a lot of our conversational approaches when we're exploring things is gonna be non-directive. So you really need the client to kind of find their own way as opposed to forcing them into something. And so again, looking at specific skills or again, how to implement this. So we've talked about our different acronyms with things like rule and ORs, and then just looking at some general communication skills. So it talks about, so asking, listening and informing. And so again, it's asking those open-ended questions, listening to the response, right? So you have to have that, that paraphrasing, right? Where you're showing that you're engaged in listening and allowing the client to really kind of work through things. And then informing, again, we're gonna give some education because we're gonna give tools, but we're not coming up with the solution. So if they go, yeah, I really would like to lose some weight, but I'm not sure of the best way, then you would say, well, I have some thoughts on that if you'd like to hear them. So again, I, we can talk about caloric deficits, we can talk about increasing exercise, but again, then based on what you inform the client, they'll go, okay, well, I wanna talk more about this. I'm not sure if I could do a diet. Let me talk about a diet. So they'll kind of go more into their relationship with food, etc. We've already talked about pouncing on client change talks. So once you've identified something, there's a pattern known as elicit, provide, elicit, which again, this is how we get them to keep talking. So you elicit a response, you give them some feedback, some information, then you continue to ask questions and elicit more information from them. Again, you've got to keep the conversation going and get them to do the talking. So if the conversation just goes, I don't want to change, and they stop talking, right? That's kind of the end of the conversation. So, you know, you have to ask those open-end questions and get them to keep eliciting responses, get them to keep focusing on what they want to talk about or not talk about and how they're, they kind of meander through the conversation. And then lastly is change itself. So again, looking at what they've talked about changing, why they're interested in changing or what they're interested in changing, why they're focusing on that, looking at their success or their tools, and again, continuing to explore that. And so next the book talks about frames. And so frames is kind of a modified, no pun intended framework for how to use this style of behavior change and counseling, but for one time intervention or snapshots or short intervention. So again, if I'm not gonna see a client time and time again for my acute care patients, this is really what you're gonna be looking at is so using frames. So I'd make sure that I have a note card and really understand this one. So the first one is so feedback of personal status. So again, you need to explain to the client where they're at, what's going on with them. We then look at responsibility or personal responsibility for the change, which is you, know, you kind of have to let the client know, I can't do this for you you have to take charge and make this behavior change. And I know it's normally counterintuitive, but this is very different where it's very specific. We're gonna provide advice to change. So again, looking at those behavior changes and we're gonna provide them with a menu of options. So instead of letting them explore, well, I could eat less, I could work out more, I could do this or that, you know, and letting them just kind of explore the endless opportunities, you just go, do you wanna do A, B or C? And that's what I'll help you with. Then show empathy, again, with that counseling style, which is, I know this is hard right now. I know this is a whole lot being thrown at you. So again, you're showing that empathy for their feelings, their frustration, their fears. And again, you wanna boost their self-efficacy. So again, looking at previous experiences, looking at how they can increase their confidence. Yes, you can make this change. Yes, you can be successful after this heart attack, right? Or you might get a referral, but again, it's finding a way to boost their confidence before they leave the session. Now, one of the things we have to take a look at with this motivational interviewing is a client's motivation. And so again, we talked about it's very difficult to make someone change. Now you can 
try to hopefully make them want to change. But part of that, right, as we talked about, is going through those different stages. So for example, we can combine MI with the trans theoretical model. So first they need to recognize the problem exists. So you go from pre-contemplation to contemplation. Hey, I do have a problem. You know, we'd like to see that the patient may be expressing concern about the problem non-verbally. They might show anxiety when discussing the topic. They might fidget. They might try and avoid the topic. But again, we can see that they've now recognized that there's a problem. And then hopefully what we're going to see, right, is you do these things like decisional balance. So again, you're still working from this contemplation to preparation to action. You're just using motivational interviewing to get there, right? So this is one tool to use within that model. And so again, we see, so for example, the client may feel positive about the change and they want to try something, right? I'm willing to give it a go. Let's move into this action phase, right, which shows improving self-efficacy. And from there, we need to take a look at goals. And this goes back to our previous framework for how do we create SMART goals. So again, these are ideally going to motivate change, right? So I want to attain this, right? That's my new behavior, my new goal. And they set a standard with which the client can compare their current behavior. So if my goal is to exercise 30 minutes three times a week and I'm currently at zero, either I hit the goal or I do two days a week and I'm two thirds of the way of, towards the goal etc. But again, using our SMART framework, these need to be clearly stated, reasonable and attainable. And again, that's something that you might have to help the client with, right, is their expectations because of all these messages we see in media, oh, lose 20 pounds in a month, right? And we have to say, okay, what's reasonable, what's healthy, what's sustainable, right? And how do we help the client actually set proper goals? Next, the text talks about the health belief model, which is not motivational interviewing. So this is completely separate. And so this is a specific model for looking at behavior change and how we can get people to change behaviors. And so this theory believes that health behaviors are motivated in relation to the degree of fear or perceived threat of illness. So you need to make flashcards of these because these four are very likely to have something like this on your RD exam. So the belief, for example, is perceived susceptibility. So the first thing that we have to convince the person of is that it can happen to them, right? So this is, for example, this theory helps explain why teenagers make poor decisions is because they don't believe susceptibility. It can happen to them. We also focus on perceived severity, which is, well, if it does happen to you, how bad is it? Now, for example, with things like cardiovascular disease, we've gotten so good at stents now people don't really believe that cardiovascular disease is a big deal. Or for example, something like diabetes, because we have all these therapies, it's not that big a deal, it's easy to treat. We need to make sure that people understand, no, it is a big deal. This is very bad for you, and yes, it can happen to you. We need to also show the perceived benefits. So if you change your behavior, what's the good thing that can happen, right? What, what's the benefit to the patient, client, etc.? And the last concept is the perceived barriers, which is what's going to potentially stop you from maintaining this behavior, changing this health behavior, following your diabetes diet, following your cardiovascular diet, etc., etc. So the health belief model suggests that people will engage in healthy behaviors if they value the outcome. So again, looking at that perceived benefit, again, why is this important to you? And then can I actually demonstrate or show why this is valuable to you? And typically what we see is an environmental cue to action where people have a quote unquote health crisis. So all of a sudden people have chest pain or people have a family member who gets a disease process and they start taking things much more seriously. And of course we know with self-efficacy that if people believe they can make the change, they're more likely to be successful in maintaining that change long term. Next, the text moves into directive counseling. So again, the previous techniques we've talked about for the most part were non-directive with the exception of MI, but even then there were constructs within MI that were non-directive, so letting the client do most of the talking and controlling the direction. But again, this text also emphasizes dietitians as managers, and that is directive counseling. So this is things like supervisor or manager employee relationships. So when I need to direct or change a behavior, the manager is aware of a problem or concerned about the behavior of the employee. And again, the employee may be unaware of the problem 
or unwilling to address it. And so we need to then change that behavior. We need to change tardiness. We need to change procedures. Are people taking orders correctly? Are people sanitizing surfaces correctly? So on and so forth. And so looking at this directive counseling, we have several different stages. So the first is the involving stage. So again, you want to bring the employee in. You want to have the right tone. Again, right, our objective here is to solve a problem, not just be punitive. And again, right, focusing on the fact that our goal is to improve performance. We want to stick to the facts. This is your behavior. This is against the policy. And then we'll kind of go and take a look at our next stage. So that's the exploring stage. So again, based on facts, so I see you clock in. I see you're late frequently. And then we can discuss the issues and discuss the specific behaviors. So why is this happening? What's going on? What are your thoughts about this? Etc. We then have the resolving stage. So this is looking at options on how to correct the behavior. And again, if the behavior is not corrected, what are the consequences? And then coming up with a specific goals and plan of action. And again, even in this stage, we're still using some of our classic counseling skills, right? We're making sure that we're allowing both parties to do talking. We're doing our paraphrasing, our probing. So can you explain more or why are you feeling this way? But again, our goal is to come up with a solution that is acceptable for everyone. So again, depending on why someone's tardy, is this an issue with the clocking machine? Is this an issue with parking? Do we need to change someone's shift hours? So on and so forth. And then lastly, we have the concluding stage. So again, we're going to verify understanding of consequences if behaviors aren't changed. And again, as you've seen, if you've ever had a meeting with your boss, so the manager documents the goals and the plan of action. Again, everyone signs off on the fact that, yes, we had this talk. Yes, I understood the consequences. This is what I'm going to do to change my behavior. It signs that it goes in your record, and the issue should then hopefully be concluded. And so then lastly, of course, we want to measure the outcomes of counseling. So again, we want to attain the desired goals or changes in behavior and assess the results of the counseling to determine the effectiveness. So this is twofold. One, was our counseling skills effective? And then two, if the behavior didn't change, then what do we need to change about our approach so that we can get the desired behavior change from the staff, employees, etc. And so with that being said, I thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions.